Thank you for staying and sticking around for our last conversation of the day. Um, this is a conversation between Vasif Kortun and Lisette Lagnado. Vasif Kortun is a writer, curator, and teacher in the field of contemporary visual art. He's the programs and research director of SALT to open in 2011 in Istanbul and was the founding director of several spaces, including Platform Guarantee Contemporary Art Center in Istanbul, Project 4L, Istanbul Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Museum of the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College in Annandale on Hudson. Kortun has curated numerous exhibitions in Turkey and internationally. He was the chief curator of the third Istanbul Biennial 1992 and co-curator with Charles Escha of the ninth Istanbul Biennial in 2005. In addition, he cur co-curated the sixth Taipei, Taipei Biennial in 2008, the second Biennial of Ceramics in Contemporary Art in Abisola in 2003, the 24th Sao Paulo Biennial in 1998, amongst others. Korten organized the Turkish Pavilion at the 52nd Venice Biennale in Venice, and he is curator of the UAE Pavilion at the 54th Venice Biennial in Venice. In 2006, he received the award for curatorial excellence from the Center of Curator for Curatorial Studies in Bard College, and Korten lives and works in Istanbul, and I'm sure I didn't need to introduce him to many of you. Lizette Lagnado is a writer and curator holding a PhD in philosophy from the University of Sao Paulo in Sao Paulo. She's professor in the postgraduate master's program in visual arts at the Facultà de Santa Marcellina in Sao Paulo. Lagnado was the coordinator of the archive of Helio Watisica's work, and her original approach to this research has led to an increased study of the artist. In 2007, she was chief curator of the 27th Sao Paulo Biennial, and she recently co-curated Drifts and Deviation, Derivations, Experiences, Journeys, and Morphologies at the Rena Sofia in Madrid. Lagnado has contributed to publications on many artists such as Dominique Gonzalez Forster, Thomas Hirshhorn, and Riva Neuenschreider. Recent published articles include Documenta 12 in Castle, Home and Homeland about Alim Shibli's photo series, Eastern LGBT and Nafas Art Magazine, and Turning So Many Corners on the work of Renata Lucas in Freeze in May 2007. She's also the editor of the online art magazine Tropico. Lagnado lives and works in Sao Paulo. Thank you very much, both of you, for coming. Okay, um, my, my point to, tonight will be to, uh, to talk about uh, horizons. Yes? No? Ah, okay, okay. No, no, I prefer. So, um, I took the, the title of the horizons because it was uh, offered to, to us. But actually, after I was thinking about it, um, it came to my mind that um, I um, uh, wrote about it uh, with a different uh, terminology, and it was, I invented, kind of invented, the idea of an echoless, echoless utopia. Uh, Echoless, an utopia without any echo. So um, I'm going to present a few ideas of how uh, I work and how I understand myself as a curator and how art and politics uh, cross my, my activities and my practices. But first, uh, I would like to make a brief report uh, of what 1989 means to a Brazilian crit critic since uh, I guess I may be uh, the unique uh, South American contributor in this Congress. Uh, I strongly <laughs> thank Maria and Cosmin for 
uh, insisting in my participation, but this makes me, uh, put me in a kind of trouble, since uh, it's very curious that Brazil uh, used to represent itself as West. Uh, this is how children are learned at school. Uh, they, uh, they are learned that uh, they are Western, and the East is uh, the Japanese immigration. Uh, and when I had to think about uh, 1989, I had also to uh, come back to 1985, which I would uh, pretty much consider a key moment for the end of the military dictatorship in Brazil. And it is when uh, actually we elect, we know, it was not a direct election by people, but, but uh, Tancredo Neves was selected as president by uh, Colegio Eleitoral, I don't know how you say it in English. But to make the story short, Tancredo died <laughs> and the vice president, uh, José Sarney, assumed. Uh, and then the, the process of the redemocratization uh, started uh, very slowly and not really smoothly until 1989. So uh, this date functions for us as well since uh, it represents the first time that after 1960 Brazilian people could directly vote on, his, on its candidate. It's also the beginning of the end of the Cold War process in South America and um, I can give you quick notes about the, the region or the, the context, the situation. Maybe the most remarkable fact for the region is that in 1989 Pinochet will leave Chile. Uh, I won't go uh, through the, uh, the other uh, countries. What, I, what is also very uh, in, intricate is um, that the first elected president, Fernando Collor, will happen to be uh, the first elected and the first impeached president uh, for reasons connected to corruptions. Uh, then in, I can say that in 1989 also uh, uh, it's a turning point uh, regarding uh, the AIDS AIDS consciousness, uh, it gained a true reality uh, and it still scarcely mentioned and still demands a real re-evaluation of the symbolic influences of this disease uh, upon artistic imagination and practices. Uh, in 1989 is the date when, for instance, men, well, one of our most important artist uh, at that moment was uh, positive, sorrow positive, you say. Um, and after he died, I also uh, organized his uh, archive. And I remember that uh, many of my colleagues warned me that art community had other urgencies at that moment. So this is how uh, I feel 1989. Regarding my creating practice, um, and by the way, uh, I think uh, there are very few activities comparing to any professional creator, and I, I must say that this also reveals a, a lot about my methodology. Um, if I had to summarize my creating activities, I would say that yes, they are by, based on a critical dialogue and in both perspective, uh, uh, critique and artistic and historical framework. But mostly, uh, they are rooted on a long-term research project. Uh, um, for instance, the show that Vivian mentioned that I organized for the Museo Nacional Reina Sofia uh, I know it's a scandal when I say that it took me almost two years between the moment I started until uh, I could reach the, all the documents that I needed because practically uh, I was dealing with uh, oral uh, history 
and we didn't have any written or organized archive to make the research. So, uh, for this reason, uh, for any professional curator, two years is too long to make one exhibition, but I still consider that I, I didn't have time enough to, to find all I needed. So, for me, it's all a matter of invest investigation. And maybe, as a scholar project, uh, this can come, uh, then cross my mind, but this is not really a scholar method. I would say that it looks like a scholar project, but the, the, the methodology is another one. Uh, on the other hand, I have a kind of intellectual freedom uh, which doesn't please at all my former colleagues when I was studying philosophy. So every time I, I am presented as uh, with this background, I know that uh, it makes a kind of uh, threatens in my colleague. So uh, it's not curatorial, neither um, academical uh, for each uh, model, I would say. For me, curating has a strong affinity with translation, and uh, it's a kind of, I would say, translating from a language to another, and in this way, we all know it's about this form and transforming, and invention of another discursive regime. So it's a lot about experimentation, and. Um, uh, method, as method is not sufficient, uh, of course, selecting and limiting are politically uh, uh, acts that are much more important than the wide openness. Uh, this is kind of ironical. But um, uh, I'm going to, to explain myself also uh, regarding uh, some uh, texts um, written by Simon Sheik, when he um, presents himself as a curator and as activist. Um, and I would say that for me the exhibition is just one medium. Uh, and I'm not sure it's always the best form to shape a group of ideas. Hmm? It seems to me that the word horizon is in this platform form so, sounds like a less concrete term for revolution. Um, in any text one selects, utopia means nearly uh, horizon, and this horizon will ever be reached. This mobility is both its charming as aspect and our fate. Huh? So from Simon, I understand that activism can be released through an exhibition, um, and maybe later uh, we, I would be happy to hear more about how he combines together two terms that I, I personally cannot combine, which are horizon and activism. Uh, to me, they sound antithetical. Actually, I agree that the utopia desire is gaining now another term. Uh, much more effective than the nostalgia feelings uh, toward the past. Uh, and it's also very symptomatic that this revival of the nostalgia, um, this feeling uh, uh, came after the crash of the American real estate and ironically it affected housing development. So homes and housing uh, were um, the the moment where uh, the crisis uh, opened. Well, um, unfortunately, I don't have the images of Ahlam Shibli. Uh, it's a series that she presented in the Biennale I organized. Uh, but as Palestinian, uh, what was very nice from Ahlam at that moment is that she presented a work uh, stressing the issue through the significance of religion and uh, sexuality and how is it to not to feel at home 
uh, when your body is forbidden to, let's say, follow its, its, its drive. Uh, so this was an aspect of uh, uh, possibility to discuss home and housing. And also I think that coming from her history, this was particularly important for me. And this is why I think that being an artist can sometimes may not be enough to change the world. I don't know if you all have the same feeling here, but there is a huge distance between political imagination and doers. Uh, I think that uh, several times we, we bumped into this um, problem. Uh, the matter of the doers forced me to trace uh, in my work architects and urbanists. Uh, I, as I understand that, that they act as planners. Uh, uh, also, uh, this was a way to, to go backward in uh, Eliot Sika's program, which I understand as a program that uh, well, it's difficult to, to explain with Sika very quickly. Oh, no. uh, this is the building that was mentioned uh, to, twice yesterday and today also. Uh, so we had a great uh, challenge to present an exhibition there. Um, based upon the program of Eloit Sika, and I hope I will be able to to talk about it a little bit. In in the Oit Sika program, there is this effort uh, to for duration. There is this effort to blur the line between institution and life uh, and the nature of what's public space and private space. Uh, so this is also why when I was preparing this exhibition for the Reina Sofia, I, I found in Lina Bobardi the, uh, uh, maybe a, um, a source to, to, to think better uh, how, what's the nature of this playground, this place to, to, to play. You know? and, and, and this was a discovery for me. Uh, and uh, I suddenly understood that the limits of Oitsika when I compared Oitsika with uh, Lina Bobardi and the possibility to, to build a Belvedere in a... Um, uh, uh, above, no, uh, on, on, sous, under, under the, the museum of, uh, of the, under the Maspi. So uh, she created there a, a kind of, I would say, playground. It, it's not a term that she used, but it's a term that Oitisika will re-vindicate re for him. But actually, she did, as an architect, what a real builder could do. Uh, so in this sense, I would problematize here the, the idea of activist. Also because I'm quite sure that Oitsika would never accept uh, to be rotulated under the, the target of activist. Uh, but I understand in Simon uh, text that to be an activist has to do with practicing a public activity and producing a change in the community. So if it is this definition, we agree and we can continue. But uh, it happens that maybe through participation in a forum or in a classroom or writing in a magazine, uh, doesn't matter the scale of the audience, among all these possibilities, curating occupies a minor space, uh, at least in my life. Um, and I prefer spending time 
uh, more time writing than organizing exhibition. But here we have a problem since um, I don't, I'm not sure we are all here discussing the specificity of making exhibitions, uh, political exhibitions. So there is a domain which must be controlled is, I don't know if it's the best term, but you must uh, be very, um, you, you, you must know your limits and you, 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 you should know um, if you want to present an exhibition rather than a presentation or writing an article, uh, these are really uh, different supports, but you can be an activist in different supports. Uh, so uh, I understand that making exhibition is something um, more, I wouldn't say popular, but it's, it's something that can give you a um, bigger platform. It's something that gives you more guarantee because we still wonder if our readers are actually reading what we are writing. So in this sense, if you manage to put, to specialize your ideas, you, have, you get a, uh, this possibility to influence your audience. No? Um, in this contribution here, I uh, would like to, to invite you to think with me um, to rethink a uh, critical reconsideration of Oiticica's platform for the Brazilian avant-garde at the, the biennial that I organized. Uh, um, for those who are not familiar, uh, there are three terms very important to understand this avant-garde that Oiticica meant in the early 60s. First of all, participation. Then, of course, this means a demand for a collective involvement and the need to share the activities inside a group. Uh, the second term important is anti-art, uh, rejection of prior definitions of what's aesthetic and universal categories against the market, against the elitism and against intellectuals. So this is also another problem for us here, as if we think uh, ourselves as um, critic and um, politics and intellectuals, uh, in this moment I think that Oetisica will would quit us. Uh, the third term, uh, also problematic term, is his Programma Ambiental. Um, Programma Ambiental had another term, uh, which is Parangolé, which was very bad understood as a, uh, it was reduced to a textile creation. Uh, it, and it was spread as the cape of uh, the dance that the, you, you can use. But actually, the cape is only one possible manifestation of this program. Uh, essentially, this program was meant to be located in unsuspected sites, streets and vacant lots. Mm? So, uh, I have stated several times that Oetisica, yes, he knew and he read Guy Debord's critique of the Society of the spe Spectacle, but maybe it was much more positive regarding uh, the future, uh, since he considered in 69 the possibility of cre leisure, uh, a term that he coined. Uh, this uh, doesn't exist. With cre leisure, he articulated his disagreement with standard behavior. Cre leisure was for Oetisica a possibility to drive people for participation in a collective action. And my question here and my invitation is uh, should we now understand leisure as um, a problem 
for populism. I will, I hope I will arrive there. Uh, it's important to stress the local context uh, of Brazilian modernity. Uh, it is a context inspired by European avant-garde in one side, uh, and also uh, by the Anthropophagus Manifesto, which is a basic manifesto to understand the hybridism and identity. Therefore, Brazilian culture do not carry any blame or have any um, uh, bad conscience or heavy culpability in presenting its many components even when these elements come from the foreigner and let's say an international matrix. Therefore, for Brazilian culture, the otherness is indispensable and it's a factor that will obviously be perceived from the left intellectual, but it will be perceived as a lack of concern toward a national culture. And this is a very sensitive point to be problematized. We cannot put in the same balance the idea that Oiticica had in the 70s, um, wanting to be uh, being cosmopolitan, a sophisticated notion pertinent to the beginning of modern cities as described by the man of the world, uh, from Baudelaire through to Benjamin's description of Naples, Marseille, Paris, etc., Moscow. Uh, to being international, and that was the feeling in South America after the Second World War and during the Cold War from the 50s on, but we cannot put in the same um, balance uh, uh, being globalized uh, in the advanced industrial and digital society. So I think there is a confusion here uh, when we misread this willing um, uh, how to remain critical. This is uh, something I would like to pay more attention attention, as Sao Paulo is now included in the globalized map, how to be both anthropophagous without uh, and receive the, 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 the international inputs without receiving the accusation of having been obedient to the global evil system. Mm? How to resist against pessimism without falling in the populist trap. Mm? Actually, this is a struggle. The struggle was not new. It's uh, something uh, that tropicalism uh, um, understood and, and, and wrote, uh, also another manifesto. Uh, and now we have to face a perversion of this lost utopia, trop tropicalism, in the name of another term, which is tropicalization, maybe. Uh, uh, I was thinking now, m maybe the nice thing of Utopia is that they are never fulfilled. Because uh, if tropicalization is the fulfillment of tropicalism, so uh, there is maybe a good, um, uh, how would I say, a good uh, a quality in some ideas, uh, they should live as horizon and they should never be realized. Um, well, this is another topic. Um, well, therefore we can see an impossibility to cope with a dialectic relation between the local and the international. Uh, as we know for Oswald de Andrade, uh, the poet uh, who uh, responsible for uh, this uh, manifesto, there is no pure identity at the source, but already a blended project. And this blended project can be understood as autonomous if it both criticizes colonial cultures, uh, uh, so not to follow its patterns taken as a model, and if it also divorces its praised 
qualities, only its praised quality. Uh, and this is also to express that xenophobia is not welcome at all in this platform. Uh. The manifesto uh, was an interesting way Oswald expressed the idea of uh, poetry to be exported, stressing the tension between historical past of Brazil as a colony, represented by Brazil's uh, material like the wood extracted from the forest. And here I would like to come to a, uh, and to project a picture from Elio Melo's painting and, uh, and to introduce these images and, uh, which were difficult to a presumed intelligentsia coming from the very high level of academy. Uh, when I presented uh, the Acre estate, uh, see Acre here in the map, so just one minute, um, you, you have it in the red uh, part of the map, uh, it's far away from Sao Paulo, and it's also far away from any interesting or interested curator or art critic, because uh, the, the art production in Acre is basically, um, not that one, but just to give you a picture now, um, it's basically art, uh, handcrafts and um, commercial handcraft. But it happened to me that I did a research trip before the Biennial and I met um, I met, no, I, I found these paintings, the, the artist had already died. And what was really fascinating for me, it was, and I think I belong to a non-Western gaze, because this artist had no academic training, no market, and he was dealing with important notions I needed to stress uh, uh, in the biennial. Uh, his work is mainly about what territories stand for. It's about self-organization, sustainable growth, and local knowledge. No? Um, um, so, with the Acre, uh, I could manage um, an art residency. I, I installed an art residency program there. And for instance, Maria Tika Potrick was there and uh, stayed for, I don't know, two, three months. Uh, but maybe I'll talk about her a bit later. My question is, how to continue toward the so-called program ambiental, which is not exactly an environmental program. I normally I I don't agree when it's translated into environmental, since it has nothing to do with the North American tradition of land art of environmental art. And nowadays, I also have to stress it much um, more because it has nothing to do with the ecological naturalistic uh, compartment because environment could have this terrible meaning that it would be an ecological art. No. So my question is, is populism the contemporary fate to attempt to postulate a free zone uh, 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 and to postulate the notion of the public, which has terribly missed uh, in the 60s and 70s, and is now available, but it has been replaced by the notion of the market. Uh, uh, yes. So, no, um, I think uh, I have much more um, inputs maybe to to, to present you, uh, but since this is a conversation, <laughs> uh, 
so let's continue and then we make the exchange. Hello. Okay, it's, it's working. Um, would it be would it be crazy to open the doors in the back, perhaps, to get some more air? Because I don't know how you feel, but I'm going to sleep while I'm talking. Um, okay, that's going to be my first presentation with the iPad. I hope it's going to work out. Uh, I've been testing it all along. All right. So basically, um, uh, I'm going to do a kind of a historical overview and, ba and set up a basic scenario of the last century as to how modern and contemporary art inhabited spaces, institutions, and the social body in Turkey. And what have been the general shifts in these inhabitations, to what degree the Westernization project was of success. What are the possible divergences in the horizon? And mind you that I just want to go about this in extremely, extremely broad strokes with overarching generalizations and with a lot, lots of glaring gaps in the, in the process. And I will disregard a number of specificities for the sake of the coherency of the argument that I want to make if it's an argument. Um, what I will describe here will be aligned with the founding of a particular kind of national middle class, an instituted class, in effect an institution. And how that national class uh, was replaced, uh, replaced a proto-colonial economy and wealth, and how we moved toward the break, uh, to a breakup uh, towards the global economy of that institution, that instituted class. And I'm not here to play cry baby, sob and complain, and and project all the evil on the Western establishment. Because I think the curious case of Turkey is that the establishment cannot be faulted, blamed for, or emancipated from. And emancipation here is a pretty hefty term, I know, but let me drive it home once again. I'm talking about two things simultaneously. One is an emancipation from the local elite's interpretation of modernism. I'm also talking about the emancipation of local elites from the demands of their own interpretation of modernism. So different modernisms, different subject positions, different elites and different emancipations. Uh, a few historical facts. Now the construction of Western style institutions or the Western style institutions were founded in the late 19th century, in the third quarter of the 19th century. The civilizing mission, this kind of civilizing mission was pushed by a reformist elite or reformist orientals. Ecole de Bazar is the third quarter of the 19th century, followed by the Museum of Archaeology. And it's interesting to note that even the fundamentals of the Museum of Archaeology uh, at that time was more than uh, what we now call hunting and gathering. And it was imagined in an imperial and colonial manner very much like the archaeological trends of the age. Hence, it was important to stack history together from Alexandria and Ephesus as if they were all part of the same place, which was then the empire. And the Ecole de Bozar at that time was completely staffed by Levantin and Armenian uh, students and teachers, uh, some Greeks, and the Turkish Muslim student body was under 11% in the School of the Fine Arts. Hence, the early history of westernization did not necessarily include Turks when it comes to art or museology. Now, the 1909 Young Turk Revolution is a watershed moment, and in my view, the beginning of a very, very dark history that ensued it. And if we get to the specifics of art, the shift is from a proto-colonial scene with a mild marketization in Istanbul to a nationalist one that bears all the signs of a late 19th century nationalism. And in 1909, with the Young Turk Revolution, uh, all the teachers at the Ecole de Bazar were fired, 
except for Oskan Efendi, uh, the Armenian sculptor. They were all made persona non grata, kicked out of the country immediately, and the staff at the Ecole de Bazaar was repopulated by Turkish teachers, and the student body shifted as well. And all the rich exhibitionary culture of Istanbul during that time completely came to a halt. You don't see any exhibitions after 1909, basically. And this is followed by the foundation of national museums in 1914, which indicates a critical shift in ideology from a westernizing scheme to, a, to, a sub, to an assumed national narrative, uh, from a shift of collecting uh, archaeology and, and from antiquities to collecting national treasures. Now, uh, after the war of independence and the formation of the Turkish state, uh, that is from the end of 1920s until the late 30s, the state goes ballistic on the citizens. There's a violent, violent uh, crash course in inventing Turkishness, inscribing the social body, categorizing and sorting out those who are to do the teaching, those who are to do the, should, who should be the, do the learning. And if this project is pretty clumsy in certain parts, you know, borrowed from Stalinist Russia, and in other parts borrowed from nationalist, nationalist, nationalist socialism, it succeeds by its sheer force of mobilization, total mobilization, through the education system, the army, the press, and everything else. And in this kind of totality, the artists and art educators are mobilized and kept somewhat happy through state exhibitions of painting and sculpture, village institutions, and sending artists to the regions and exhibitions from the regions. It's interesting that in this period, the art history got completely rewritten not that it was really written before, but it got rewritten and these and moments were invented to secure the Turkishness of the, of the late 19th century as well. So semi-fictions like the School of Industry uh, was located as the Mühendisani Beri Humayun was located at the, as the origin of uh, Turkish painting, whereas these are just well, like technical draftsmen drawing for the palace. And all the minority exhibitions or minority laden exhibitions or the kind of decadent, uh, ex decadent concepts clo closer to the, to the, uh, to the kingdom uh, in the late 19th century were written out of history, as, just like the minorities were erased out of history. Now, the history that so that the history was that was reconstructed did not only invent the past but also invented a future and it charted a civilizing future in, a, in accordance with some kind of uh, filtered uh, cleaned up western european not western, european narratives and this, these kinds of this kind of vestiges of this uh, totalitarian europeanism is uh, pretty much uh, present uh, at the moment even if it's on a kind of a break point at the moment. Now, uh, the appropriation of the Western establishment by the ruling system as an agency that filters and selects is always an interesting issue, I think. Because those in power now and then utilize their authority to generously reflect on things and have, are the sole power to do so. So, there was a lot of, there were a lot of a set of dualisms produced, such as art and craft, uh, local culture production, traditional, traditional culture production versus, versus novel culture production, high and low, civilized and the crude, modern and traditional, the privileged representations versus uh, those that did not need to be represented, progressive and regressive. These were defined as pretty much night and day. Now, this would also turn uh, presence into a historic past and align the whole cultural landscape into a catch-up game with Europe, always accepting to be late, but more importantly, always having an imagined claim over the neighbors. So the dirty Arabs, the lazy Bulgarians, were not uncommon, this kind of uh, ideology. So the elite positioned itself between these geographies of, uh, of the former lands of the empire, versus a European, uh, West European scheme that was uh, to be synchronized to over time. So progressive cultural sphere was only that, it was progressive, modestly. 
always linear, chronological, at the risk of museumizing its past, eliminating the possibility of moving in a different direction from within the institution. Now, naturally, over, over uh, this embedding process was not viable or justifiable after a certain after a period. Even if it not, was not viable or justifiable, the the system had already created its ideal agencies, ideal subjects that would carry the narrative over, even if it's deformation. Now, uh, protected by the borders that 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 they were empowered by. The local powers became the self-appointed agents of a kind of a Europeanism. And as modern copies of the periphery, they had little place to expand their discussion to. The works would adorn the wall of a provincial national museum, providing all too common localized genealogies and insular histories. There's obviously another story out there which has to be which we have to com be confronted with, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just go going through the state line, basically. One aspect of the reaction to the national heritage was due to its involvement into an international style, and this was passed on to new each new generation by the ever Euro Europeanizing elites through non numerous Bozar and Bauhaus traditions that were often supported by an ascriptive, enlightened, progress-oriented elite and their institutions. The institutional structure, instead of providing possibilities, dictated the, res the restrictive dogmas of the centers. Their general rule was to play up a catch-up game, creating highly restrained, surface-oriented versions of what was modern. So the peripheral producer would enter into an elitist dialogue with the immediate viewer and into a humiliating relationship to the penultimate goal, a place in the Western tradition. The embedded artist mission were not as blunt any longer from the 40s on, and even much more relaxed uh, after the Second War. And then, of course, came the middle class and the 1960s. And the middle class of the 1960s is this kind of modest, reluctant, and relaxed class with their own Volkswagens and you know, new families. And it's exactly during this time one of the most legendary characters in Turkish politics and culture, Bülent Ecevit, came up in an article with a strange term called Chadas Sanat, which was called contemporary art. It's very interesting that the term, I mean, I'm kind of stuck on this term contemporary art in Turkey because the way he constructed, Bülent Ecevit, uh, may he rest in peace, the way he constructed this term had very strong ideological underpinnings because it was a shift away from the other terms we used to use, which was asri or muasir, which means uh, of this age, in of a, word, a term of Arabic origin, which was the most common way in the past of saying it. We shifted to cha and chadash, which uh, chadash in, Turk, in English would mean like art, uh, chadash sanat would mean art of the century. So like the, you know, the, like the name of the Peggy Guggenheim Gallery in mid, mid 20th century New York. But Chardash already presented a very, very strong narrative. It was progressive, it was left or center, it was modern in form and content, but mostly it was very modern in style. It was Western, but more European than Western. Hence, even it may have been far from contemporary as a concept, the contemporary art of Turkey had to live with this burden for a very long time. You have to also have to understand behind the Chadash is the sweet engine of progress. I mean, that behind that sweet engine of progress, there's the apartheid of the state, the public educational institutions, the industrial state monopolies, and the engaged uh, intelligentsia supported by and supporting a middle class, the construction of which was not tied to an economic order. So, for example, if you think, and think of an example, you know, if, if you look at the... Uh, uh, at, the painting, at the painting traditions of kind of representational painting uh, depicting the rural folk by the urban artists, of course, um, they are as radical as kind of mid 19th century French painting of the rural tradition. It's, uh, it's laden with very extremely generic 
uh, generic and idealized ver uh, imaginations of what the, of what the rural uh, constitutes. So it doesn't matter if you're coming from the southeast of the country or the northwest or whatever, a village woman is a village woman, a worker is a worker, uh, a tree is a tree with no specificity as to what they are actually. Or, you know. But it didn't matter as long as the buyer was happy, the onlooker was happy who was urban and the, and the painter who was happy and, and he was urban too. So the represented was obviously, as usual, was out of the question or out of the equation. Now this whole happy urban moment suddenly crashed into the moment of 1968. And it would be super interesting to discuss the moment of 1968 uh, here, but that's the subject of another discussion. Uh, and we lost our innocence, modesty, and even our claim to, uh, our potential claim to public space. I mean, let it be said that before the realization of interesting discussions uh, taken into public sphere, the moment of 68 actually forced out publicness and locked the sector into further institutionalization of art and into restricted spaces and zones and galleries and whatnot. And in the 70s was another story because uh, the, uh, after the coup d'etat, I mean the second coup d'etat in 1970, um, the the contemporary, contemporary art of a particular kind was either in the, sur in the street, completely in the service of, uh, as a service sector for, uh, for political movements, or it was hidden away uh, from view to a large degree in small galleries. A lot of artists did both, uh, obviously. You know, they were painting banners, but they were also painting from Gusen Kara Mustafa, Orhan Taylan, many others. I mean, the 70s is interesting in, in many ways because uh, the, the context of Turkey is very specific during time because there's the Cyprus, uh, the invasion of Cyprus, which was followed by the embargo. Uh, there was the banning of the opium production uh, or the forced banning of the opium production by Americans and forced planting of certain kind of uh, crop uh, turkeys uh, shifted to different kind of crops. Uh, but however, because of the embargo and the context at that time, there was a complete, uh, there was almost a radical disintegration from world economy. So, like, unlike countries like India, that was like ruthlessly pillaged uh, in the 60s and 70s, Turkey was not. The 19, then comes the 1980 coup, and that, uh, that's perhaps is, uh, another defining moment uh, in that the 1980 coup offered a lot of things. One, that it, it instituted a neoliberal capitalist economy. Uh, it contributed to the invention of a new middle class. Uh, from the position of uh, the, the culture, uh, cultural producers, the contract was broken completely between the government, between the state and the, and the artist or the, or the cultural producer. I mean, the contract was probably broken before on the part of the government and the state, but the cultural producers had not realized that completely. Uh, that was an ambiguous moment. But after 1980, nobody in, the, in good faith uh, or uh, or, you know, in, in good faith would ever ask anything from the state. Um, but what does that mean? That means that you only fall in the laps of the of neoliberal economy. So what happened is that uh, after 1980s, uh, a kind of self-help, uh, self-initiative context uh, went hand in hand with, uh, with a particular kind of bonding uh, bonding and working with uh, with private uh, business. Now, I mean, just to go back to uh, just to go back to 1980s. I mean, the the context is quite interesting. One is obviously we have the first and last. Uh, I mean, first and last anti-imperialist revolution in the region, which is the Iranian Revolution. Uh, that was a very interesting example for, I think, the whole world, probably. And the second is, uh, I mean, obviously, Turkey's uh, shift to neoliberal economy and the dismantling of this huge administrative class, which means that the dismantling of the state economies and national economies and uh, monopolies and etc. 
and the replacement of that middle class by, uh, by, a, middle, by a new middle class which is invented through monetary, uh, monet financialization and monitor, monetary terms. Uh, so they come with different form of spending habits than the administra administrative middle class that comes before. And then uh, 89, the end of Bureau of Socialism or Office Socialism. Uh, there's the maturation of Kurdish nationalism and the pressure of democratization, uh, the democratic process that, uh, that, uh, that follows it. Um, I mean, 85, 89 obviously shifted the geography in a radical sense. I mean, everything that we thought was in the West became suddenly uh, was coming in the in the eastern direction. So when there's migration patterns, you know, migration patterns are no longer from Iran and you know from Iraq. I mean, south up or 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 or, or east west direction. But then migration patterns when they when they go from north south, let's say from Ukraine to you know Ukraine to Turkey or Moldavia to Turkey and Moldavia to Istanbul and on, that, that 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 completely threw us off in a way because we. Uh, you know, for us, the, the concept of West was quite directional. You know, it was a geographical location, West, and that and, and that shifted with 1989 completely. This kind of geographical shift because of reverse migratory patterns, um, and the role of artists I talked about because of the privatization of uh, the educational sphere. Um, the cultural synchronicity due to uh, due to new technology, new communication technologies. Um, so-called capitalist transparency and um, no, just hold on hold on okay here we go and then I was reading years ago this is a quote that I love to go back to often uh, by Louis Kamnitzer and he wrote this in 1990 uh, I'm just going to read this 10 lines to you, and then I'm going to go on from there. Um, many of us, members of the diminishing middle classes on the periphery, will continue complaining about the exclusion of our art from art history. The complaint is based on both on our acceptance of the parameters that determine art history and our trust that we are part of the hegemonic horizontal circulation mechanism. Our real support group, the one that nourishes our art, the site-specific middle class, is ceasing to exist, and so are we as its expressive tool. The traditional path to success was to make it big within the local middle class, to then be catapulted into the international market. It was a process hampered by the dynamics of imperialism and chauvinism, but success was not completely, completely out of question. If, however, our home class disappears, things are bound to become worse. Now, um, and uh, following with uh, following with the contemporary art, Chadas and that question is the is that I proposed a new term in the late 90s. I think it was late 90s or mid 90s for contemporary art, and it seems to be taking hold slowly uh, in the in the local in the local parlance. Uh, publications and institutions, etc., is that I, clo I closed, I, instead of using the word Chada Sanat, I chose to use Gunja Sanat, which uh, is simply completely devoid of any ideological uh, weight. And the, it was a political move at the same time because it was a departure from a kind of a Western secularist progressivist implications of Chada Sanat that I did not really want to uh, touch or dwell with. Um, especially in the in the recent years, the backlash uh, from military deep state and you know cheap fascism, contemporary became more of a more and more of an enforcement. Uh, the, and so, and whereas Gunja lacked, lacked all these underpinnings of being something of the moment and nothing uh, more than nothing more than that. Uh, what it does, but. Maybe it was, I, I don't know, maybe the, the, the term could have been hijacked in a different way instead of proposing a new term because, um, because it creates a divide at the same time. I don't know if divides are, are, are very productive ways of going about things uh, at the moment. Um, I mean, 
Finally, all of the, I mean, all of the recent stuff, in, I mean, recent situation, you all know very well. I don't think we need to, uh, I mean, I don't think we need to address here in, in terms of uh, the move south and east. Uh, what are the implications of that move south and east? Uh, does it have to do with the financialization and marketization of certain zones? Uh, does it have to do with the density of capital? Does it have to do with the, with the kind of the, uh, the, the free movement of capital in a in a you know in a very you know in a very particular way um, because the art world as we know is like super implicated within these processes and uh, that you know it's it's I mean that kind of uh, new direction and new zones and new nodes uh, around the world and the disappearance of former nodes uh, does not does not so much address the issue of uh, former west or future east. Uh, but that has to do with uh, another thing that we had to talk about, which is basically economy and, 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 and how it works. And, uh, but as such, I mean, Istanbul is clearly very much uh, um, implicated within this uh, new context as a city on steroids, uh, as a market on steroids, uh, as institution building on steroids. Um, it happens to be one of the richest cities in the, in the world at this moment. It's kind of a bull economy because everything is being sold now and for the future and forever. So there's, uh, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of cash going around, I should say. Um, but all of that makes history at the same time. So who am I to say if it is the economy, but or if if the context has more, it will have more implications than um, than if the, if this new context will actually be. Uh, not a passing moment, but, but history itself. Thank you. Um, Lisette, did you, would you like to respond to um, Vasif's talk, or Vasif, would you like to respond to Lisette, or should I open the floor to questions? We have 20 minutes. I have, a, I have a question to Lisette because you, you started with Ecoles Utopia, but I lost you. I lost the Ecoles Utopia. Maybe you did not finish. That's because you did not finish your paper. Can you talk a little bit about that? What do you mean? Oh, yes. um, thank you for the question. Actually, uh, when I organized this exhibition for the Reina Sophia, um, I thought um, it would be interesting to, um, to present São Paulo as a city who might have different avant-garde projects, uh, but these projects were, uh, how you say, uh, étouffés. They were smothered. Uh, uh, because when we study contemporary art and avant-garde in Brazil, you always have Rio de Janeiro in front as a model. So when uh, I went across different uh, avant-garde, not, not avant-garde, but modernism in the beginning of the 20th century, I found in Flavio de Carvalho uh, possible uh, idea of what would be um, a rupture, uh, what would be someone who could have had a project for the city, uh, he was an architect, uh, but he was very much interested also in psychoanalysis and in the crowd and the multitude. So he uh, uh, um, implementized for me the possibility of a total artist and coming from um, his background being an architecture background I think um, um, what I wanted to stress it's something that we heard today uh, uh, through part of the presentations is that urbanity and the rationalist program that South America received and we were, we are uh, 
celebrating the 60 years of anniversary of Brasilia, I, I, I was wondering uh, how far we can consider that this is our real utopia. So um, I went through different other architects or artist architects as Lina Bobardi and also Flavio Di Cavallo and I took his um, experiences uh, with the city, a city that transformed itself from the 30s to the 50s. It's a very different city, you know. Uh, and I realized that this was an echoless utopia. Actually, I, we, we can see Lina and these other agents as proposer for an utopia, but uh, we still understand or we still have the, the symbol of Brasilia as the icon and of what's utopia. And this, is, this has nothing to do actually with our way of, uh, we, with our social uh, neighborhood and the way we, we circulate, etc. Oh, but I, I have a, a question for Vasif. <laughs> but uh, Simon, you, you're not escaping, no? You, you know that there is a question for you. You remember? I think. Yes. Uh, the, the issue, um, I don't know if I will be able to transmit it clearly, but let's try. Uh, when we exchanged a uh, conversation before I came, I, w I said that I was interested to discuss the, how um, uh, leftist arguments or anarchist arguments that Oitsika had in his program were turned into a populist program now. So when uh, we hear uh, the formalist critique and also uh, if you read the Ernesto Laclau, and he's not talking about Oitsika, but you can find, you can trace the same words. Marietika Potrick also, I came with a, a catalog. If we, if we read her, I'm sure that Ernesto would consider that this is real, uh, a new populism. Huh? And when you wrote that, uh, when you said that you would be interested in discussing post-secularism, uh, actually you didn't mention it in your presentation, this gave me the possibility to make the bridge uh, between what's a messianic uh, art should be and can be through religion. Uh, and also, well, I had previously thought that you would like to talk about the, the Istanbul Biennials that you organized because we have something in common because we have a huge uh, a density of population and it's super different than a biennial done in Lyon or in... <laughs> so you can understand that the issues, the urbanity with which we have uh, to lead, uh, to, to deal with, are uh, similar. Yeah, I was just trying to... <laughs> I, I want to hear more about uh, well, how you, you can claim for a collectivity, a collective subject, how difficult it must be um, not to, do, <laughs> to fall into yeah. the trap of the well, messianic... Um, no, I mean, it's, I mean, one, uh, a, a few things. I mean, I was trying to somewhat skirt the question. I mean, it's just, or let's say, avoid the question through going about it in a, in a, in a different way through the secularist, um, through the secularist legacy. And uh, which is at the same time very much, uh, very much here with us in terms of, uh, in terms of the way cultural institutions work, produce, and imagine audiences. Okay. And, um, Obviously, there's a, there's a critical shift going on in the sense that, I mean, it would not, uh, I would not be joking if I said that 
I would love to, although I probably won't, will not do this, or I, I would do it in a different format of sorts, not in a harsh way, that, uh, that you know, institute, uh, institute a ladies' day once a month uh, for certain hours, for example. The, the reason is extremely, extremely, extremely simple, for which the, we, I mean, the, the way the institutions are, it's not, it's not so much about uh, the kind of a messianic culture, but it's about uh, how the audiences, uh, how the public, how the public is divided in very, very particular ways. And that, that they, then there's no confrontation or there's no, uh, there's no negotiation between them because they don't actually see each other even. Or imagine each other, kind of. Especially, they don't. Uh, people, the public is not actually meeting in places of public, um, which would be, let's say, an art institution. You know, um, it's it's very clear that at the moment things are not for quote unquote for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we imagine our audiences to be in a very, very particular way, uh, with a particular dress code, etc., etc. You can't even go through some institute in Istanbul. You can't even go enter some of the institutions. You know, you will not be appreciated there. This is, uh, I mean, I will, I will, I will contest anybody who thinks otherwise. Um, let me say this right away. <laughs> Um, that's 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 the first part. Uh, whereas in, in uh, whereas I mean in, in terms of I mean, where I'm coming from, I'm I'm trying to look at I'm I'm trying to kind of restructure things in a way that it is the new situation. It is the new situation as a cultural producer and as an institution that you have to face not only in terms of how you do things, how you open your door, etc., but it's also how you how you work with the producers. But the, would the you secular, use it hmm? as an historical category? Uh, no, like postmodernism, uh, for instance. Uh, no, I, I, no. Actually, it's the ultimate modern movement. I mean, I don't see any difference in the in the sense that between the secularist uh, who has a precise dress code within which the secularist moves and and etc. So versus and, and uh, you know, a, let's say a devout conservative person who has a dress code and the way they, they, there is no difference between them. Their codes. Which operate just just differently, but their codes never, never, ne you know, nevertheless, there are particular kinds of there. There are ways of being with the world, and you know. Uh, but the, the more interesting thing, of course, is that because uh, bec because the history of the uh, of the establishment, you know, the the, the art establishment, um, you can't even the a producer who who is not. Uh, Okay, not the a producer who may be a, a believer cannot even be in the institution, cannot even enter or, or operate through the institution, cannot even bring new truths or new 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 models and new questions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because the institution is by definition closed because it is the secularist institution, blah blah blah, you know, because because they could throw live drawing to you or something like that or things like that. So it doesn't matter whatever it is, but that's. But uh, whereas uh, in our horizon and around us, and I see more and more people are talking to them, there's a whole set of different way of being in the world that there are younger artists and there are younger generations. Um, and the, 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 the insertion of these moments into, uh, in, into the sphere is will, only, uh, will only allow us to negotiate things in a more interesting way because that's where we do our negotiation, where things can come together. The way the current government is working with it is also very interesting because because of the EU process and all of those things, it's, it's promoting and funding particular kinds of, uh, or supporting particular kind of institutions or, or, or fronting particular kind of institutions. You know, Istanbul Modern is being one of them. ICASEV is doing the promotional thing for the, for the Turkish government, for Turkish government, basically, and all of that. Uh, and which is, which is inviting a very particular kind of, you know, uh, audiences, the modern audiences who are so, I mean, who are now so happy to have this stuff because they have it in Istanbul. Uh, on the other hand, the government is also, uh, through the local government as well, is, is, is producing a com diff completely different culture, cultural, let's call, uh, uh, paradigm. Uh, with the, with the, you know, museum of, uh, I think, museum of invasion or museum of takeover, Fetih Museum, or, or handicraft institutions distributed around the city. And extremely, I mean, extremely, for me, extremely con con uh, boring 
modes of culture production for any for for the kind of voter base they think they're uh, they're supporting. So what you have is a completely divided public. I mean, radically divided public between the conservative and the so-called modern or uh, you know secular, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is not a tenable situation. That's not that's not how things can go. You know, um, I mean, the, the government is duplicitous in in this policy. Uh, we are duplicitous uh, as, 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 as institution people who are not taking these questions very, very seriously. And uh, we are also duplicitous of dividing things further as opposed to bringing them together. That's kind, of the dis that's kind of the long discussion. But the history of that is obviously, I mean, if there's a blame or if there's a, the, you know, or, or, okay, if, if there's something to, unravel, to, to untangle completely, it's exactly it's exactly the, what happened between 1909 and, uh, and has been going on pretty much. That's, that's kind of thing. Thank you very much. I can't actually see, so if there's a question, um, please raise your hand. Maybe I, I, I could uh, shift uh, the conversation towards the relation uh, Turkey and Brazil have towards the former West. And maybe I can provoke you by uh, uh, telling that we in the Netherlands are uh, uh, a, a nation of thieves. Um, we stole from Turkey the tulip and from Brazil the potato. And uh, the potato. The potato. Yeah, and uh, as you may know, that um, the 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 tulip comes across in the work of Mondrian, the most famous Dutch painter, and the tulip fields as a, a, a basis for his abstract work, and the potato, of course, in the work of Vincent van Gogh, and. Um, um, so I'm getting this to a maybe surreal level, but I wonder how you feel about that from your point of view from Brazil and from Turkey. So to paraphrase, you wonder how they feel about the theft of the potato, or is this metaphorical? Yes, I was asking the obvious rhetorical question. I'm trying to figure out what we stole from the Netherlands. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, look, I mean, we're talking Turkey and Brazil, you know, these are not, I mean, okay, we're, you know, I mean, Brazil is a big colonizer of sorts and you know, it's an extremely powerful country. I mean, the colonizing the Latin America. You know? uh, Turkey is a different kind of context, obviously. You know, we have never seen a left government, for example. You know, they've been going left for the last 12, almost, well, nine years now almost, no? Uh, eight years now going into the ninth uh, steady situation, which is actually a very interesting, I mean, which is a very ex interesting experiment that's going on, actually, in Latin America. We, ours is a bit, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, we've, they've seen, I mean, they haven't seen as many dictatorships as we have, although this was as, this as traumatic as, as ours. That's a common situation, I think. Um, no, I, it's, I mean, look, I mean, for me, Brazil, Japan, there are a few countries in the 20th century that cannot be avoided. Thank you. Turkey can be avoided in the 20th century. And it's, it's becoming an interesting place of sorts now, in large part. It can be avoided. Yeah. It was not what it was supposed to be. It happened this way. There was a genocide. We lost our lungs. You know, there's, this, is a, this country is based on kind of a uh, deferring of a very, very dramatic moment uh, in self-denial, childhood. I mean, there's a, there's a whole other layer here, with, with, which is very specific to Turkey, I think. Uh, I don't see any other context, I don't see any other place that's going through this, this kind of thing. And, and it's, it's 100 years too late, uh, the trauma, we're finally going through the trauma in a, I think in a, uh, in a 
let's say, more or less healthy way, finally. Yeah. Um, but I'm interested to know uh, what would be the roles of a biennial in this context? Because yours is uh, younger than the Sao Paulo Biennial has 60 years now. Uh, but actually, I was saying, we, we, ha we deal with um, the same uh, urbanity. Uh, uh, and when you present now uh, your culture background, it seems that you don't have any um, hope regarding Yes, uh, what would be the role of uh, exchanging platforms or uh, is it possible or is it meaningful or does it mean something for you? Because you have been twice the curator of the... I, I, mean, so I, I would say that I don't think Bayani is an, I mean, is an agency for that uh, at all. I think the... I don't think the biennial is the agency for that, uh, but I do think, despite what I have said, uh, the research even has not been uh, done. The, for the research to take place, the context for the research has also, ta has also to take place. Mm -hmm. but, the, but, the, uh, but the level of erasure, first by the, uh, you know, uh, by the formation of the state and whatever followed it, and then three levels of Eurasia, which is the three dictatorships, mm. uh, is so radicalized that you know uh, the moments that are that have to be inevitably uh, re reproduced, invented, and discussed. We don't have that at those. We, you know, we're, we're not at that moment yet. This is this is a process that is going on now. The memory and the archive is happening now. At, at, at many levels. After that, maybe I'll take all my words back in, you know, in, 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 in 10 years and I'll say, you know, this was really not right because I did not know the history that should be known about, that could have been known about. I'm working on, I'm, I'm talking from a position of the, the history that's been thrown at us, not the history that we know, that we may know. There's a question from the audience. Could you introduce yourself, please? Um, my name is Inti Guerrero. I'm a curator. Louder? Okay. <laughs> Not that loud. Uh, just a brief remark on the um, constellation of the Toad of the Potato and the Mondrian, and then I'll ask a question to, to Lisechi. Um, it's interesting that you brought the Mondrian and uh, made um, Lisechi especially to react because. Oiticica uh, actually uh, cannibalized that Mondrian. He was the uh, he was he was the Mondrian that never happened. No, if you yes. see the um, heritage of the monochrome, to put it in a very very uh, synthesized way, I'm not going to go on to Oiticica. I think that it's something that you just have to research if you are uh, intrigued or interested. But in the case of Lisecchi, I think that. I mean, for foreign eyes, you could say that uh, you have always this idea that Latin America is living the moment of that the left and the people is in power, no? So the cases are the typical. So it's Lula, so it's Evo. In a um, bizarre figure, you still have Chavez and the Kitchener's, no? In the case of Lula, no, of Brazil, uh, obviously you still have the symbolic that it's the workers' party that's on power. And we both know that there's too much corruption in Latin America to that dream, uh, for that dream to really come true, that, it, that it's uh, the real socialism could possibly happen. But to a certain extent, um, the welfare state that Latin America has never had somehow in these governments, it's kind of like becoming a bit established. The question now, yes is um, I was, it's intriguing that uh, in your biennial, in one of the seminars that you organized about, uh, on the biennial that was yeah, co-organized with uh, one of the co-curators, you invited who was then the Minister of, of Environment of Lula's government, who was actually running for this presidency but lost in between the two candidates. And well, we all know that 
the Workers' Party now uh, still continues, no? Could you just briefly tell us, like, what was that experience of actually having a politician and a political horizon which is, let's say, a global discourse which is on uh, the environment, and we're Brazil, obviously, because of the Amazon plays a big role. Uh, what is that experience within the curatorial and the exhibition that you did? Yes, thank you. Um, the, the Acre experience, um, if I can quote with Sika, the uh, Whitechapel experience, we had the Acre experience, uh, was an intent to uh, not to repeat the very fashionable um, methodology of having art residencies. Because normally what happens is that uh, a couple of artists are thrown in a wild situation or in a fantastic uh, uh, landscape and then they, they deliver a work that uh, is not convincing at all. What uh, happened with Acre, in my thought, I, I don't know how far it was understood by everybody, but this is not important, but uh, Acre represented uh, for me uh, the possibility to join uh, local knowledge and um, n n not universal, but uh, local knowledge and um, technology developments in, um, in a sustainable way. Uh, and this, I think that in this way, Marietica was very close to this, uh, to this issue. Uh, I can read uh, uh, what she said when, when she approached the community um, and she, what she experienced. Uh, this is important to, to, to follow here. For me, it all comes down to the question, what does it mean to live a dignified and responsible life today? I realize that the community struct structures in Acre are not intended as models for other communities. The things I have mentioned here are simply their practice, a practice of sustainable existence. For me, their strategy recall over, over 21st century experiences, such as the new states of the Western Balkans, which were formed when Yugoslavia collapsed in the wars of the 90s. Like Acre, this region too has become pixelized into small territories, territories that are rejuvenating themselves by implementing practices and pursuing aspirations similar to those of the people of Acre. In both cases, scaling down in producing a scaling up in which particles and group identities are no longer static and self-enclosed, but, but dynamic and open to the world, I believe that faster and slower worlds can exist simultaneously in parallel realities. The Western Balkans and Acre seem to me the fast words, in some ways a way of the rest. And this possibility at that moment, that you, when you visited the Biennial, I think it was open. Um, it was open and it, it closed after uh, Marina. The, the, uh, we invited her as a real and true represent, representant of uh, the Acre situation. But what changed now with our elections was the moment she assumed, she had to assume it publicly, uh, her uh, religious or evangelical um, commitment. And then all the debate of the elections turned in, uh, twisted. It, it turned into a very moral discussion toward uh, women right and abortion and uh, so 
it's not the same Marina, I would answer you. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to have had Marina in that debate and uh, she could deliver the best uh, seminar and conference that we could have had about how it is uh, how to live together in small territories. And for that, she was really brilliant. I think that your question uh, would, um, mean, would invite me to make a political uh, statement that I don't have in this case. Uh, because she represents, uh, in terms of, uh, not ecology, but in, uh, if you compare the program of, of Dilma uh, for the forest, and the, the, because Marina was f fired by, uh, by Dilma uh, from this ministry, uh, environment uh, ministry. So if you compare, uh, the two you, you would rather see in Dioma, um, um, how would I say, uh, uh, a drive for development uh, and not uh, respect uh, as, uh, as the forest or as Elio Melo were uh, putting it in, the, in their work. It's super bad explained, but uh, uh, the strategy uh, at that moment, uh, Marina represented and embodied what would be the University of the Forest, what would be an, an alternative for the power, but then she had to quit the worker party, and then in the Green Party, uh, things changed. I don't know if it's... Next logic. Um, it's ten after seven. Do we do we have time for I uh, yes. one more question? Okay. Questions are welcome. No questions are welcome. I know. Maybe I will ask the question, but he won't have time to answer because a, a kind of. No, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, uh, I just wanted to ask this question because uh, yesterday I found uh, um, Charles Arcade are very optimistic for the future, but today um, uh, I found Vasov very pessimistic for now, future, almost no horizon. Uh, so I, I, we are all uh, almost living in the same country, but we have different horizons. We, uh, we are almost living uh, uh, neighbors, but uh, we have different uh, visions what's going on. But uh, what I will going to ask Wasif is that uh, in his presentation, he uh, draws the uh, historical points and uh, the moments of art, its relationship, mostly the political changes and so forth. Uh, right now, um, f uh, from my point of view, uh, in the last uh, maybe 10 years, it's a process of implementation of neoliberalism uh, together with uh, a rebirth of Islam uh, and modern Islam. Uh, uh, of course, it has uh, many, um, uh, many things that we cannot say no because uh, right now, uh, we cannot say no to the civic rights or uh, human rights and so forth, which uh, is to be uh, implemented. Uh, uh, however, uh, we know that we are turning to East. Uh, yesterday, I asked the question of, uh, are we looking at the capital, you know, uh, turn our uh, faces to Dubai or Abu Dhabi. Anyway, um, you make connections with the political moments, historical moments, and uh, 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 how it affects the art. How do you see the uh, current development, political and economic developments, had a, uh, an impact of art? Did art uh, kind of uh, try to find another space to react it, or it also developed uh, through the mechanisms of that implementation. Thank you, Fulia. Uh, 
I mean, I, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not the person to answer this because I'm kind of consciously trying to stay away a little bit from, uh, from the general artistic practice that I, that's around me uh, in, in the local zone. I'm more pessimistic about that than anything else, I think. Um, the way that it's been financialized in a very, very wrong way. It's been, uh, I mean, self-co-opted, not even co-opted, you know. Uh, the, the, the proliferation of, I mean, uh, the proliferation, the endless banalities, uh, the lack of research on a lot of artists' part. And so, in a way, the, the place to look is not so much, I think, at the moment, the art world, but perhaps other places. Uh, I mean, that, that's, I hope, is the, is going to, I mean, I'm not, I'm not so, I mean, I'm not pessimistic. It's, it's not at all. Uh, I'm not optimistic either. I, I, I should say it like this. Uh, there seems to be a, the main problem is that there seems to be a very, very big difference between what we see, what we read, what we hear, and what we discuss and the fundamentals of presence at the moment. And, you know, I mean, that's, that distance is extremely worrying uh, in terms of uh, the resource, you know, what's happening to the resources of this place, what's happening to the water. Uh, you know, what's, there, there's a lot of stuff that, is, that we're not even talking about because we're just overburdened by everyday issues like, you know, what did Abdul Jalan say today? What did the general say yesterday? And well, you know, this is kind of all the kind of superficial uh, discussion under which, under which basically, yes, through this government, a lot of uh, we're, you know we're losing the resources of the fundamental resources of the country, and we are on a pillaging, uh, a mode of pillaging, which I think is is, is reason to worry. Uh, but I don't think a lot of artists are thinking about that. Uh, a few certainly. Um, so it does a. You know, I mean, that's, it's, it's hard, it's, it's not an issue, you know, it's not so much about, you know, but to say from the, the horizon, the east west thing, I mean, to refer to Charles R. K. there, or uh, also, also to answer your question, is that, no, I haven't had a Schengen visa, it's been six months, I think. I, I just see no, I mean, it's not about desire to go or not, I try to go less to Europe as possible, I mean, as much, I mean, as less time as possible, this is for certainly true, it's a personal thing, uh, but at the same time, I just don't go at all, it just doesn't happen, whereas in the, in the old days, it was just that you would, you know, that was kind of your direction most of the time, even if it were lateral. I mean, even if it were lateral, because I mean, after '89, we lost, we we kind of changed from the vertical order of vertical order of travel, you know, by playing over hop, hopping over places and ending in Paris or whatnot. And, you know, I mean, there was this kind of lateral lateral movement after '89. Certainly, you know, you went to Sofia, which became important, or 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 or, or, or Pristina and whatnot. And the artists were different kind different kinds of networks that had that that had not existed before. Uh, now the same thing is going on for Cairo. Or or, 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 or Beirut or other places, certainly. Uh, it's not, you know, uh, the, the, this kind of turning to the West or the, or the East, I don't think it's a very particular question for the history of this place in, in a fun, you know. Um, and when they were turning West, they were not really turning West at all. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's not the West uh, we knew of anyhow. I mean, it was it was always uh, it was always super super filtered. There was the agency that decided for you what the West was and how much of the West you were going to get, and uh, so you you got the clothes, but it would not you know democracy was too much. You got that, but uh, everything had to be modest. You know, you got the modern clothes, but you, but the body had to be degendered. I mean, if you look at the, the 20th century dress codes and and body movements, you know, it's. You know, up until the recent years, it, it's degendered. You know, you look at the artist's work; it's degendered. I mean, the gendering of the of the practice is a very new thing. For example, you know, it starts with John Ashel and a few others, and then that maybe Neil Yalter is a kind of a one moment in the 70s. Uh, but you don't even, you know, I mean, the body is uh, is a body that has been defined by the secular state with double, double suits and et cetera, et cetera. You know, this amazing modesty, which is also a uniform of sorts, which has, which jives very well, and is, in, is it actually is in rhythm with, uh, with other, forms of, uh, other forms of dress codes that are 
being exercised at the moment. You know, you know. I'm very sorry, but I think we do need to wrap it up for this evening. I'd like to thank both of you very much for participating in this conversation and all of the other speakers for the day.